Now, you may have noticed so far from listening to this podcast that we tend to shine a light on long-term conditions, things that we call chronic diseases. And these are conditions where there tends to be an element of, a really important element actually, of learning to live with a disease. It can involve changing your life considerably. And today we're going to be talking about Crohn's disease, which is a really good example of a condition where you absolutely do have to learn to live with and make changes to your life. I'm really thrilled to be joined by today's guest, Carrie Grant, who I'm already nostalgic about the Fame Academy <laughs> and the Pop Idol days, um, but is a renowned voice, um, voice coach and also TV presenter, presenting on shows like The One Show. Um, and check this out, you have trained, take that, Spice Girls, mm -hmm. Gwyneth Paltrow, Charlotte Church. You're good. How amazing is that? <laughs> <laughs> amazing. So yeah, very, very honored. But also you were diagnosed with Crohn's um, nearly 40 years ago. So in, in 1983, is that right? So I got ill in 1983, but wasn't diagnosed till 1986. Okay. So we're coming up to your 40th Crohn's anniversary. Gosh, we are, yeah. <laughs> so, so you've got a lot of experience with this, Carrie. Mm. And we always start off this podcast by asking the same question. So, the question I'm going to ask you is: <laughs> What is the one thing you should never say to somebody who is living with Crohn's disease? Oh yeah, I went on holiday and I had a runny tummy. Ah. Uh. <laughs> like, right? You had diarrhea once. <laughs> yeah. You drank some water overseas and you got a little runny yes. tummy for a couple of days. And yeah. they think that that's, Thank therefore that's, they that's think comparable. they have some understanding. <laughs> right. Um, so let's get us into this. Would you take us back to the beginning? Yeah. So you started having symptoms. You had two years before you got your diagnosis. Yeah. How did it all start off? Talk us through it. Yeah, so it started off that, uh, as I've just suggested, I started having diarrhea. Uh, in the mornings, I was like this urgency to go to the toilet. And... That went on for weeks and I thought, God, this, this doesn't feel right. It's not something I've eaten. Yeah. Um, I'm, so I went to the doctor, went to my GP and my GP said, I think because you're in the arts, you're probably anxious and that's causing you to be ill. Mm. And I kind of knew that wasn't the case because I'd been in the arts for like four years at that point. Uh, from 14, I was doing stuff. So I, I kind of knew that wasn't the case. But I, you know, I think... And it's terrible to say this when I'm sitting here with a GP, but no, I think no, I just it. thought the GPs know everything. They're, they are the gods. Mm. And so therefore, whatever they say is true. So I then went away and just, I started to almost think it was in my imagination. And then I was ill when I was filming down in Plymouth. And um, I had terrible pain in my chest. Um, and I, I went to see the doctor there and they said, oh, you've probably got a hiatus hernia. What we need to do is just increase all your dairy products, <laughs> which was the worst thing that we could have done. But that was the kind of yeah. stuff that people said back then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think I was given like milk of magnesia or something. Um, and it was really played down. And so I then went to, an, I was in another part of the country, went to a different GP and I was told, we think probably your white cell count, your, I think you're run down, your white cell count's low, we'll give you a boost of white cells, which is probably the worst thing you can do uh, with someone with, with Crohn's because that, you know, that it's an autoimmune disease. So the body is attacking itself. It thinks there's something wrong and all those white cells go into action and start doing their thing. And, and that's how we end up with inflammation. Um, and so what happened was, Two and a half years in, the whole side of my gums, down the side of my teeth outside, was basically, all the ulcers had joined up and it was starting to kind of open. Oh my god! Like a gully down the side of my gums. So you had lots of ulcers in the mouth. So Normal many, like apthous ulcers that many, we've all had one yeah, or two of at some point. Just a regular point. ulcer, but you know how painful an ulcer can yeah, be? And so they, yeah. they'd all joined up. Ouch. So I went to see a dentist. Right. And this was a dentist that one of my friends had referred, had, had mentioned. I was living in London at that time. And I went to see this dentist. He took one look inside my mouth and said, do you get diarrhea? Mm. I was like, yeah. Do you get skin rashes on your trunk? Yeah. Do you have lumps on the front of your shins? Yes. I was like ticking every box. And he said, I think I know what you have. And he was also a professor at University College Hospital. So I got referred to UCH, UCLH. And, um, and within a couple of weeks, you know, I had streams of students looking in my mouth because 
they were saying this is Crohn's disease, but yeah. it's presenting in the mouth. Mm -hmm. and, and that's how I got diagnosed. And I guess it's a good time just to give a, a quick description of what Crohn's disease is. So yeah. as, you, as you've said, it's a, it's a long term, complex, chronic disease that's autoimmune. So it's your body's immune system um, causing damage to your body because it's seen things as as, as baddies when they're goodies. Exactly. Um, <clears throat> and it can affect the whole GI tract from the mouth to the anus, which yes. is how it differs from ulcerative colitis. Exactly. Which has a lot of similar symptoms, but tends to just affect, well, primarily affects the, yeah. the colon, which is You're the large good. bowel. Yeah. Well, I'm a, well GPs <laughs> do know, the thing is, yeah, GPs do know a lot of stuff, but we don't know everything. And, yeah. you know, and it, it is, I think, you know, I would hope that nowadays um, that, perhaps you would have had a better experience? I think for many teenage, particularly girls, what happens is they get ill, mm. so they stop eating because they mm. know that every time I eat, I feel ill, or I've got a tummy ache, I'm bloated, I've got diarrhea or constipation. And I think because of that, often it doesn't get picked up. So yes. we still have issues for people with Crohn's and colitis because of that very reason. So quite often, Again, they go to the doctor, the doctor says, oh, this is just a teenage to not eating properly. And yeah, then the yeah. parents get really judgy, mm. start monitoring everything their child's eating. And mm. and then the it's parents feel awful the when their child is then diagnosed with Crohn's or colitis. And I think it can be really difficult, especially for young people. But I think there's a really important message in that. There was something you said about when you were first told, you know, you're in the arts, this could be anxiety, you've got a lot going on. You knew your gut feeling, your spidey sense told you that's not right actually. Yeah. And that's very, very powerful. And you know, to anybody who's listening to this and you've sort of felt a bit fobbed off by your yeah. GP or doctor or healthcare professional, if you have that feeling that what you've been told isn't right, you must mm. tell us because yeah. you're probably correct. You're absolutely right. But that's I think, difficult to do, isn't well, it? Well, we're often taught to shut that down, mm. your gut instinct, yeah. you know, your gut brain. Yeah. Uh, but that's, it's ticking away there the whole time. And it's, you know, I, I knew that, that that wasn't right. But I, again, it's to do with how you're taught to think about authority, yes. don't question authority. Absolutely. Whereas these days I, I would I would push back a bit, you know. Yeah. But maybe when you're younger, you don't it's, have the it's confidence difficult when you're to young. do that. I always say, you know, there are two experts in that room. There's the doctor who's had loads of training and has loads of knowledge, but doesn't know everything. Um, and then there's a patient who is the absolute expert in themselves, how they're feeling, and that gut instinct is really, really important. Um, I wanted to ask, before all of this, had you heard of Crohn's? Did you know about it? Did you, did you have any idea that this could be Crohn's? The weirdest, weirdest thing happened. I went to UCLH and had a biopsy taken. I went away, didn't know, I'd never, still no one was mentioning what it was. I sat in my flat at home and on breakfast television, Selena Scott said, there's a chronic disease that people have that no one talks about. It's called Crohn's disease. Mm. And they started talking about it. And this is so important why we need to do podcasts yeah. and TV and all of that, because she talked about it and I thought, that's what I've got. They've just said all the symptoms. So I went back to UCLH and the day they were meant to be giving me my, my results and I said, I've got Crohn's, haven't I? And they were like, how do you know? Yeah, well, I said, well, because it was you. on breakfast TV. There we go. Yeah. That, and that is absolutely, that's why we made this podcast. That's why it's so important that we're talking about health as much as yeah. possible um, through TV, through podcasts. And that's why it's so incredible that you do all the work you do as an ambassador for Crohn's and Colitis yeah. UK, as well as the, the other causes that you support as well. When I was researching this topic and, you know, one of the things that I really struck me was how young you were. We know that this is a condition that actually can be diagnosed at, at any age, um, but you were only 20 and you started having these symptoms when you were 18. And as a young girl, as a teenager, with mm. everything that's going on in life, with all the changes that are going on with, you know, everything still from your, your getting to know your new body to... Yeah exploring relationships to trying to find your way in the world when it comes to work having that on top how was mm. that for you I think for me I'd had quite a difficult childhood uh, emotionally psychologically and there were certain things that I had as an as a young adult promised myself that I would never let happen so I would support my own self financially I would go and get a job I would get myself a flat as soon as I could I'd never let any man hurt me so I had all this stuff planned you know and I was quite a strong young woman 
but I hadn't planned for sickness. Yeah. Well, you don't, <laughs> and I think do that's you? the thing. You, you don't plan for it. And so mm. I was sideswiped by that. It was absolutely shocking. And I think, and I always say this to people, however long it takes you to get used to this, to normalize it and to get your head around it, just take your time. Mm -hmm. I think it took me five years from my first symptoms to actually feeling like, okay, I can live with this now. I was well into my 20s, 23, 24, um, before I really understood, this isn't the end of your life, Carrie. You may have something for the rest of your life, but there's still so much life to live. But I think that process takes a while. But I, I always like to tell people it will come, that sense of you're not gonna feel like you feel now for the rest of your life. It will take a while to normalize. It will take a while to get used to having this word disease hanging over you, carrying the weight of that. A label is a weight. And, um, but also chronic long-term conditions, as awful as Crohn's has been for me, have, have also, has also given me some of the most incredible assets to my personality and character that I don't think were there before. The resilience and the strength and the appreciation of life. All of those things came as a result of having Crohn's. Did, did you go through that cycle? Did you at times feel angry and the denial and finally reach that acceptance? Is that? Yeah, I, in, when I was 23, I, I got married at 23 to David. And who you're still married to I'm today. still married who you to you do everything now. together it's with. nuts. Yeah, where is he? Um, I know, I can't believe he's yeah, not here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and um, I think, you know, that was so joyful being married. But within a year, I was having um, a resection of my bowel. So a piece of my bowel was taken out. And, you know, then you sew the, the little bit back together again. And that was major. I was in hospital for two months wow. um, leading up to it, during it, and afterwards. I was very, very ill. Mm. And I think during that time, I just thought, my life is over. I'm never going to enjoy life again. I can't possibly work. How can I function as a human? I'm just stuck in this bed. And I remember one night in hospital, in Adam Brooks Hospital, Cambridge, laying there. And, and it's always light, isn't it, in hospitals? As you're laying there at three in the morning, it's like it's daytime because yeah. there's lights are all on, everyone's shuffling about and doing stuff. And the, the lady in the bed next to mine died and I just thought this is hell this is I can't think of a worse situation will I ever get through this and I remember as I lay there just thinking this sentence popped into my head which was you've got to let go of what you've lost and you've got to embrace what you've got left because actually you've got lots of stuff left you just can't see it right now. And the minute that sentence, like a truth, hit my soul, things began to change. I began to stop going. It's like driving whilst looking in the rear view mirror the whole time. Suddenly I could see a future. I stopped moaning about all the things that were wrong and how I'd lost, 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 grief, loss, and started to think about, wow, some days are good. Some days I can... I can get up out of bed. Some days the sun is shining and I can create. And and suddenly life didn't seem as bad. It's, it's just so powerful what you just said. I can just imagine, you know, I've, I've been lucky that I've, I haven't experienced such an illness, but I can imagine there'll be people listening to this podcast right now who are perhaps you know, haven't reached that stage yet. No, exactly. And Lots, I'm sure. And, and I think I think what I would say is don't push yourself to rush to that space because yeah. you can't make it rush. But you'll know, you'll know there'll be a moment where you'll go, this is an opportunity to move on and grab it while it's there. You know, I do think when you're diagnosed with any chronic condition, it is like being dropped in the middle of Piccadilly Circus without a roadmap. You have no map. You're like, someone's just said, get home. You've got no Google Maps. So you just think, well, I know I think I'm north. I think north is that way. And somehow you find your way home. The next time you get dropped into Piccadilly Circus, you're like, this is really irritating mm -hmm. because I haven't got a map, but I did do it once before. So I know I can get home. 
by the time your third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh time dropped into Piccadilly Circus, you're like, oh, this is a mild irritation. So I, because you know the route, you know how it goes, you know what to expect. And I think that you normalize absolute dysfunction, to be honest, but that's your life. Can you tell us a little bit about the symptoms that you have mm. experienced at various stages of your disease? Diarrhea is probably the, the biggest thing, you know, I've had diarrhea since I was 17, 18, um, all the way up to 57. And so that's like every single time you go to the loo for your whole life. That's my experience. Pain, huge, severe pain where, you know, it always makes me laugh when they go, take some paracetamol. You're mm, like, are you yeah. joking? Mm -hmm. um, and then of course, some of the pain relief that you, you know, you'd like to be able to take slows down the bowel. So then you can't take that pain relief. Um, so that's a big worry. Um, the other thing would be mouth ulcers, which are really difficult for eating. Just eating yeah. is really then painful. Chest pain, if my Crohn's is down in this section, you know, between my mouth and my stomach. Um, for me, my Crohn's can appear anywhere along the tract. Right. So I can have pain anywhere and that can be on any day. I've learned to really filter out low level pain because right. you learn to manage pain, but some days that's really impossible to do. Um, plus things like skin rashes and there's probably things you know that I've normalized that I'd, I've forgotten the Crohn's things at yeah. this point yeah because <laughs> people just, are probably so shouting at the you. podcast right now going don't you get that I'm like oh yeah I do get that <laughs> I've forgotten yes <laughs> um so so what I'd love to to hear from you is you know you've had a really successful career um you're a mother to four children yeah um how on earth have you managed to, despite having this illness, lead that life, you know, that many of us would aspire to? Yeah. How, how have you done it? I think I've led this life because I've got Crohn's. Really? Because of it, wow. yes. It's made me want to go on trips all over the developing world where there are no toilets and just go, I will work this out when I've got to go to the loo in a bush. Um, that which I have. So you're, the, you're uh, the master of a wildie. I am like, <laughs> you know what? This is not going to hold me back. I think when you. I spent those two months in hospital at the age of 23, I think it just changed me. It made me say, I am not accepting that this is the end. And if, if it means I'm in a hospital bed, then I'll just become a writer, a poet, a songwriter, things I can do that are just you know less mobile but the minute I could get out of my bed I was like someone had you know pulled me back like what do you call that like a boomerang I was like Chaw, out the traps and um and so yes you know three children one adopted child yeah life I want to leave lead that big life because I don't know you just don't know how long you've got I feel so grateful for life I feel like this chronic disease has given me a gratitude for life because every day you have to, I don't know if next month I could get a flare up and end up in hospital. I, and in 1998, I nearly died of Crohn's. And I think back to those times and, and I'm like, you know what? I got to live this life because you, I don't know, I appreciate it yeah. in ways. That's why I've done all I've done. So yeah. every day I'm like, let me campaign about something. Let me write something. Let me make something. Let me be a mentor and a coach. Let me perform. Let me, all these things. I just want to grab life and, and do it. Something we haven't mentioned, actually, is that you have an MBA as well. Yeah. And my MBA is... Um, for music media and charity so it's for some of that stuff like for instance i was campaigning uh, along with lots of other people for specialist nurses specialist nurses didn't exist when wow. i first got crohn's and the first specialist nurse was in adenbrook so we campaigned for, for having a specialist nurse which makes such a big difference for those people that don't un wouldn't understand why that that's so incredible is because you can be left waiting for that appointment with your consultant for weeks and weeks on end and you need an answer to something today what should I do about this pain? Should I respond to it or should I, you know, I've now got, I'm now just going to the toilet and it's water. What do I do? You know, those questions, having a specialist nurse 
so oh important. my gosh they are absolutely wonderful they're everywhere now they're gold they're gold and you know I certainly as a GP with my patients I look after who have inflammatory bowel disease when they have a flare up the first thing I do is involve their specialist nurse yeah. who can you know speak to the consultant right there and then if it's about changing some medication it's about yes. whether to start some steroids or yeah. you all know, those quick answers yeah the specialist but you absolutely nurses need are great because yeah. when you have a flare up things can change very very quickly they really can you people can become, become very sick yes very, very sick very quickly and that so, has happened to me before yeah do you speak to your children about Crohn's do they are they aware that you have the condition so the the three children that are biologically your children um I mean we don't really understand why people get Crohn's we think it's a combination of genetics and environmental factors but you know it's, it's I think it's fair to say that if you're a child of somebody who has it you're at slightly increased risk um, yes. What, how do you speak to them about it? So with my children, they all know I have Crohn's because it would be impossible not to know. Yeah. Um, and they always, because your whole life has changed in terms of you have to plan where the toilets are and access and stuff. So they're, they're used to that. I think my children, because they're neurodivergent and uh, by that they have ADHD or autism or both, um, I don't think they need to be bothered with more anxiety at this point. Yeah. I think they've lived very close to me being ill and I don't think they need to have that added stress. If it happens, it happens. Yeah. I don't think they that need educating sense. on it because they, they know it. They know it. They know it more than most yeah. people already. And I think... And then well, they've also seen you, I guess they've also seen you the way that you live with it haven't they I'm sure they've seen you at times when you're you're in pain and you know when yeah it's not easy yeah. I mean it's not easy you make it sound like you've really given us a positive spin and there are positives and there are negatives and you've def definitely told us the positives as to why having this disease is really giving you that flair and passion to grab life um but I'm sure there are times as well where they've well, seen you Well, when you're laying distress. in hospital, just thinking, what's my life become? Yeah. What, there's no point in living. There's, yeah. there's, I have no life. I'm just a person in a hospital bed. Mm. And that's, you know, that, that's happened at various different points. Mm. But I think what happens with age is that you, you begin to realize, actually, yes, these periods of real terrible pain and low mood are there they pass yeah I think when you're younger you just think this is never going to go yeah. away whereas mm -hmm. I think I've had so many cycles of that now I'm an old lady mm. but, um, <laughs> well, you're definitely not <laughs> look at you you're gorgeous <laughs> that I'm more um I'm more aware of actually this will shift it will change it will move it's like the Piccadilly Circus analogy I yeah. think that is so clever that you're in it yes you feel yeah. low yes you're in pain but you know actually I will that get home you will get home, get home. you know okay. you know and you know the roots now you know yeah. it well Yes, absolutely. And I also, you know, I, I, I love a community. I think communities are really important. I, I run a support group for 200 families and that's to do with autism. But I think those support groups, having like-minded people, especially if those support groups have hope. Mm -hmm. Some support groups are a little moany. And yeah. if that's what you need, that's great. Our support groups generally are, yeah, you can show up as yourself and go, this is dreadful. But we know that by the end of every evening or every meeting, there's going to be a point of hope. I think we mustn't let go of hope. Mm -hmm. Hope always sits with us, within us. It's always there if we can just dig deep and find it. I, can, I mean, I can tell just having this conversation with you that that is your MO because even the conversation we've had so far today, yeah. I'm sure we'll have given so many people so many hope. Who well, are I hope right so, now. And it, but it's not, I'm not saying it's it's easy mm -hmm. and I'm not saying oh don't worry it's all great uh, you'll get through uh, those those kinds of phrases really annoy me I yeah. think it's dark it's difficult it's you do think is this my life and if it is what's the point of me a hundred percent you think that but um, I always love the moments I always call them suddenly moments I'm always waiting for the and suddenly moment you know like and suddenly <laughs> I woke up and I felt a little bit better fun, yeah. I'm waiting for sometimes I'm like reaching out for those yeah. and but like, you know I they're coming that. and that's I the know hope. they're coming and I also I've learned through this and many other areas of life that 
it's all very well crying out for your circumstances to change. Sometimes your circumstances won't change. Mm. What do you do then? The only thing you're in control of in your life is you changing. So if my circumstances are not changing, change me. How can I change? Which bits of my psyche, my thinking, the way I, what mind transformation can happen within me that will help me get through this? If my circumstances are not gonna improve, in fact, they might get worse. So I think, I don't always find this easy. I'm saying all this like it's easy, it's not easy. But, but that's what I aim towards, is how do I find hope? How do I have an and suddenly moment? And how do I transform my mind in the, in the, in the middle of this situation so that I can actually withstand what I'm going through? One of the things I wanted to ask you about is how do you think people generally in society can be kinder and more oh, understanding gosh. and more empathetic? And mm. I think a good place to start with this is around toilets because you know when we see disabled toilets and they still have the sign of the wheelchair on don't they and whilst absolutely people who have a mobility disability should absolutely be using them and, and they yeah. have the keys they're not the only people that they're there for and actually having Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis or a whole range of other chronic diseases where you may need to use the bathroom very very quickly um, then you can also apply for the special keys that unlock yes. these toilets can't you as can sometimes yes. people who have babies because it's the only place you can get a baby changing have you experienced or mm. do you know of loads. anyone who's yeah <laughs> loads I, I hear it from patients <laughs> and often, i know that, yes you know that, that people being cruel to them because they don't have a visual you know you can't see what they're I mean, not, is. I think for, for those of us who have inflammatory bowel disease, I think the thing that's difficult is that not only are, do we look like we, we're not struggling uh, with our mobility, but we also have an urgency to go to the toilet. So I think those two things, it's not just, sorry that I'm in the queue, I feel really, look, you know, I know you, obviously you're a wheelchair user, so you need the toilet, so do I, but actually, do you need the toilet urgently? Because not only do I need that toilet, but I need it before you need yeah. it. Uh -huh. So I think that's yeah. that's the really awkward bit is that you're asking to push in. Yeah. I, I sometimes find it easier to just go into the regular toilets and go, can someone just let me in the queue, please? I urgently need to go to the loo. People would really help. They're Are like, they? oh, yeah, yeah, of course you can. Okay, yeah. I find that more difficult. And do you tell them easy. the reason why? Do you tell them I just got Crohn's, Crohn's disease. Yeah, I need, I need the toilet urgently. Right, okay. and, and people just... People are generally... Like yeah, you, they are. You, they're but fine. some people don't want to share that, do they? Some people no, don't want to I share understand that, that they have Crohn's. I just, yeah, I, I overshare. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, I've, 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 yeah, I'm a bit of an oversharer too. Um, but yeah, I've had lots of patients who've experienced, you know, because it's the. I mean, we've talked a lot about the psychology of living with a chronic disease already, um, but. Yeah, I've had lots of patients who've said that they've been abused, actually. Yeah, they've been I seen have coming been. out of a yeah. disabled toilet and yes. people saying, you should not be in there. I've had all of that. And then I remember going to watch Cirque du Soleil at the Royal Albert Hall. It was such a wonderful day. Not only did I need the toilet, but I had an autistic child with me, so I had to take my child with me. And, um, and so people were moaning at me being in the queue. I then got in the queue. You know, I then had to go to the toilet in front of my child. I then leave the toilet and the person goes, you just needed to take your child to the loo quickly, didn't you? That's what it was about. Mm. And they started, and the person behind started shouting, all the security people just turned their heads like we don't want anything to do with this. Yeah. And I was like, security, why don't you do anything about this? I've got a chronic long-term condition. I need the toilet urgently. I could have gone in for my child actually because my child's autistic. So two good reasons why we could have used that toilet and we have a key, um, but no one was interested. But when I wrote online about it, the Royal Albert Hall did contact me. Oh, did they? And they did apologize. And right. I've noticed that they now have new signage. Okay. So, but sometimes even that signage doesn't make any difference. No. You know, I have autistic kids, I have trans kids, I have chronic um, bowel disease. So, you know, lots of reasons to need a toilet. And I think that, I think even just talking about it here, you know, it just, it's that message to people that just because you can't see it, just because it's not obvious, yeah, you know, just be kind, generally. I think what does happen often is that people 
perhaps look at me and I look healthy, mm. particularly, you know, I've got my hair and makeup going on. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I've even had so many people over the years who've said to me, you know, hi, how, how's it, how are you doing? How's your Crohn's? And I've said, it's dreadful. And they've said, great. <laughs> great <laughs> you're, like, you're not listening you're just looking at my face smiling yeah and thinking and not thinking you look you what, look so I look well. healthy yeah. yeah yeah Carrie before we bring on our expert the last thing I wanted to to speak to you about was kind of looking forwards into the future yeah. so two questions really the first one is how do you see the future of your life living with Crohn's disease and secondly you know what projects have you got coming up what can we look forward to from you next yeah so I'll I'll get the projects out of the way first I've got a book out at the moment called A Very Modern Family which talks about my family with all its differences and I talk about Crohn's disease in uh, in the book and how it's changed my life uh, so there's that happening. Tell us more about that though, because well, you do, you yeah. know, it's fascinating. I've, Your family is really, really interesting. Yeah, so I've got four children and they're all neurodivergent and they're mixed race and some are trans. And so there's lots of intersections, which means that my children have to access different services and quite often like education and health, sometimes social care. And the gaps between those services mean that my children are often failed, like many children that have special educational needs and disability. And so I spend a lot of my life campaigning. I talk about it all in the book and also all the incredible strategies um, of raising children that are different because you have to let go of the way you've parented and you have to shape shift into being the parent that each child needs, which means you're parenting four different ways if you've got four kids. Do you think that that is a book that it's definitely one to read for those working in healthcare and education. Oh my think? gosh, please. Yeah. Yes. I think also what happens is we're all divided and I hate that. I hate the gaslighting of parents. I hate the fact that we put pressure on individual professionals who are working in ridiculous systems. Actually, if we all join together and actually start collaborating well, a lot more could be done. We've got these incredible resources in parents and we need to be using those resources. Parents are incredible. The SEND yeah. community is amazing and we need to... Uh, to encourage our parents into believing they're amazing parents. And, you know, whilst only one in four young people gets an appointment with mental health services, what is a parent going to do in the waiting with that child? And I think there's a lot that a parent could be doing in the waiting. So, so when, when's the book out? It's out now. It's out now. Yes. Okay, so we'll link that in yeah. the in the show notes. Thank you. Um, and as for Crohn's, do you know what? I I... I try not to think too much about the future because I find it really difficult when I do. I worry that I'll have to have my bowel removed at some Mm. point. I'm like, I've hung in another year, another year. Every year that goes by, I've got, yeah, I've got another year out this bowel. Well done, bowel. So I worry about that. But more than that, actually, I worry about pain. So anything I get ill with, the minute I need pain relief it's going to affect my Crohn's. So uh, every time I have anything that goes wrong with any part of my body, I end up in hospital just because it then impacts my Crohn's. So it's the comorbidity thing. I I worry, I try not to think about it too much. I'm not in denial, but you know, I I wouldn't get out of bed if I worried about it too much. But yeah, those, they're real concerns moving forward, yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. So we're going to bring in our expert now, who is Dr. Davinda Bansi, and we're going to continue this conversation with him with us. So I'm delighted that we're now joined by Dr. Davinda Bansi, who is an expert in this topic. Um, Dev, can you tell us first of all about your experience as a doctor with managing Crohn's disease? Yes, of course. Well, thank you very much. Um, Good morning to you both and all those listening. Um, So, Dev, can I ask you, you've just listened to the conversation between Carrie and I, and what reflections did you have? You know, would you like to sort of add anything, correct anything? Um, Well, I mean, first of all, I've, as I listened to Carrie's uh, account, I came away with this feeling of how positive you are, Mm -hmm. how incredibly powerful the words that you have been describing are to all those people listening. Um, one of the, the real difficulties with chronic diseases of any nature is how do people cope? And in order for someone to cope, they need to almost have a mentor. doesn't matter what the disease yeah. is. And if they can see that there are positives, there are people out there who have actually yeah. had a positive experience or spin. You know, your, your comment that 
actually you've you know you've made normality out of diversity um you've almost put aside a lot of the symptoms that most people with Crohn's will suffer and you've almost allowed them to become the norm for you and you're looking out for those times when things escalate to a point where actually you realize that you do need help I mean yeah. all that's incredibly powerful um and Crohn's disease is one of these conditions which it's only recently in, in u- recent years that people have started to understand more about it um, and that then reflects on on the treatment options that are available so just to give you a very short potted history do you know why it's called Crohn's disease go on is someone called Crohn's yeah disease? yeah well like a lot of things in medicine they're named after people who initially described them so the person that got credit for Crohn's disease was an American gastroenterologist called Burrell Crohn and in fact in 1932 he wrote a paper in the American Journal of Medicine um, and he described his two patients who had this condition where they had diarrhea and they had bleeding and they had abdominal pain um, and he was the first author on this paper mm. um, they didn't have a ne- they didn't have a name for the condition um, and actually because it was published in the high impact journal people s- adopted the term crone because he was the first author on that paper mm. so it then after that was known as Crohn's disease but up until then it had been described by other people but never had a label and anyone in those days in the early 1900s and if somebody had a gut problem Mm. it was naturally assumed that it would be TB because that was rife in those days so you know if you then fast forward from 1932 to 1983 you know the, the, the the pivotal moments in the treatment of this condition also occurred in in the in the early 50s when Oxford a group in Oxford um, demonstrated the benefits of steroids um, and that goes back to the reasons that people get Crohn's in the first place because it is an inflammatory condition it is inflammation that somehow just flicks on in the body and your experience as you described it when you know you, you had mouth ulcers um, that is really unusual really unusual because only about um, 5% to 10% of the people with Crohn's disease actually get symptoms to start with that are outside of the of the of the colon or the small intestine um, most people with Crohn's get symptoms there which is why diarrhea and pain and bleeding are typical symptoms but actually your experience is, was the exception rather than the rule mm-hmm. and then of course later you, you develop those symptoms so it became a bit more obvious but um, you know those skin symptoms that you described the so-called extra intestinal symptoms we as, as specialists we we put all of those symptoms that are not in the gut into one term and we refer to that as extra or outside of the intestine so extra intestinal um, and it's not a common way of people to present so yours was an unusual presentation mm. I mean it'd be great to just just to add on to that for people listening who may have symptoms, what is the typical presentation that you would see in somebody so, with so this So typically, um, typically somebody may have diarrhea, they may have blood or they may not have blood. They may pass some mucus, which is a sort of slimy material from their, from their bottom. They may be losing weight for reasons they don't understand. They may be feeling very tired uh, or fatigued because one, they may have diarrhea, so they're not sleeping at night, mm-hmm. but also they may develop nutritional mm. deficiencies. So they may have low iron levels, they may have low vitamin B12 or vitamin D levels, they may have low calcium levels, all of which are consequences of the, of, of the malabsorption or lack of absorption that occurs with Crohn's disease. And, if, and I guess if people are concerned that that could be them, the next step is book an appointment with your GP who should do at the minimum a blood test and, and ask for a sample of your stool as well because yeah. there's a, a test we do now called a faecal calprotectin which is very a very good test for identifying if there's inflammation somewhere mm. in the GI tract so again that would be something that wasn't around when you no. were diagnosed no. and I did have all of those symptoms that you've just mentioned mm. it's just that they then just 
got added to, I guess, after three, two or three years, they then started to get these stuff in, in ulcers in my mouth. What, so what came first? Was it the diarrhea, diarrhea first? Diarrhea, everything you said was there first. Yeah. And I've forgotten bleeding and mucus, of course, yeah. So I was totally, well, I you forget. You did have the bleeding and all mucus, of that. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. But those are things that you now just see as normal, are they? Yeah, kind of, I've yeah. forgotten about those yeah. things. I do think also that what happens if you are diagnosed, if you're not diagnosed immediately, mm -hmm. by the time I was diagnosed, that, piece of colon needed removing the dam and I think that done. you know that's yeah. frustrating really and this is one of the reasons why early diagnosis when it comes to pretty much every chronic disease Timely including mm. this yeah is um is really important isn't it because it means that treatment started early is is much more effective actually isn't definitely it? um I mean your experience was that I think you said three years from the point yeah, that you had almost, the symptoms yeah. to the point where you were diagnosed um these days, with the advent of different diagnostic tests, we are we we do make that diagnosis more quickly, um, but also we we a bit more suspicious sometimes. You know, so when you look at certain diseases, you think, well, have those diseases become more common, or is it because we're diagnosing them more often? Yeah. So there's something in medicine which is called ascertainment bias, which basically means that if you think about something more you're more likely to diagnose it. And therefore, in let's say in any given month, you may pick up five patients with that condition. Mm. Whereas a year before, you hadn't thought about it so much and you maybe picked up one or none. Now, does that mean that a year later, this disease is suddenly becoming more common? Not really. There's an element of that perhaps because we are seeing increasing rates of Crohn's disease amongst a variety of different backgrounds. Um, you touched on it before. Um, there's an element of family history that that is relevant because if you have one member of a family with Crohn's, you're about, depending on that relative, if it's a first degree relative, so a child or a parent, or a brother or sister, then your, your risk is about 30% higher on average. Now, 30% sounds like a lot, but if you put it into context, there are one in 323 people in the UK who have Crohn's disease. So if you if you figure it like that, if yeah. you know, if the if the in, if the incidence is one in 323 and your risk goes up by 30%, actually it's not that big a jump. So you mustn't be thinking if my brother or my sister or somebody in my family has it that I'm destined to get it. No, you're not. Yeah, because a know. 30% increase of a very small risk is yeah, a, it's very, a very, very small, small number. Increase. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so yeah. It's not yeah. shouldn't be frightened by that and Carrie do you find that you know having lived the majority of your life with Crohn's disease um do you know a lot of people who have this condition do you come across a lot of people who have similar issues well one thing that actually I wanted to put to you Dev mm -hmm. was and um, I, I found quite interesting this is just you know anecdotal but a few years ago, I was speaking at an autism conference. There were hundreds of people there. I talked about having Crohn's disease, and I said, for people, put your hands up if, if you or your child is autism families, um, have got anything going on with the gut. And the majority, I mean, it felt like every single person in the audience put their hand up. Mm. So, and then I run a group, uh, a support group of, for autism families. 90% of that group is probably Jewish. A lot of those people uh, will have autism and Crohn's or colitis in the family. Is this in particular groups of people? So it's a very important point because it, it basically relates to the reasons that people get, get Crohn's in the first place. So we know that, that there is an increased genetic predisposition, meaning that certain people are more at risk and, and they're more at risk because they carry certain genes. And in back in the day, in the 80s, um, we, we bunched it all together. You know, when somebody had, was diagnosed with Crohn's disease, everybody had the same. Um, everyone's Crohn's disease was the same. Right. But actually what we know now is that Crohn's disease is actually a spectrum of diseases. So that's why you very rarely find two people whose Crohn's disease is identical because actually it's potentially the genes that they carry that determines the type of Crohn's that they may develop and so the genes that you carry are determined by by you know your parents who pass them on to you now if certain genes are more common in certain religious groups so the classic being Ashkenazi Jew then that 
those genes that those individuals carry may actually increase their risk of Crohn's disease. So that's why you find that certain diseases, Crohn's is one of them, but other diseases too are more common in certain ethnic groups um, because there is a genetic basis to a lot of this. Now, why should somebody who has these genes actually develop the condition? Because just because you've got the genes does not mean that you will develop the disease. So there has to be some other factor. Mm. There has to be some other trigger that somehow switches on that process of inflammation. Um, and that's, again, very important because if you, if you use that an analogy, then you can actually make the difference to treatment, which is very different now. Going back to your point about autism, though, that's very interesting as well because um, there, is, there, is, there was some evidence in the late 80s, early 90s, that certain vaccines that people were using, so you may have you may have read about this actually. But yeah, the our community hates the measles, that. mumps <laughs> vaccine. You know, yeah. the, the rubella, the measles, mumps, and vaccine. There was some evidence that perhaps giving that vaccine was associated with an increased risk of developing not only Crohn's disease but inflammatory bowel disease of other sorts. But that was rapidly dismissed by the medical community. So I wouldn't mm. want anybody listening to this podcast mm. to be thinking that actually it's because of these vaccines that we are no. developing disease. It's much, much more complicated than that. And the risks of not having certain vaccines are actually far outweigh the, the risks of having them with respect to diseases. And I think, I think the final thing it would be great to discuss with both of you is around treatments. And I know, Carrie, you say people within the um, inflammatory bowel disease community are always yeah. keen to hear about treatments. Yeah. So Dev, whilst we've got you <laughs> and your expertise, would you give us a rundown of, of what the treatments for Crohn's disease are um, with a particular focus on anything that is new because treatments are emerging all the time. And then, Carrie, I'll switch it back to you mm. and if you could share with us sure. actually your treatment plan. So the treatment of this condition is based upon its um, mechanism or uh, reason for being, which is the, the, the bottom line is inflammation. Mm -hmm. So that's what's causing the problem. So the inflammation, as you said, can affect anywhere from the mouth to the to the bottom end of the colon. Um, all the treatments look at how how can we reduce that inflammation, and that's why um, the first trial of steroids in the early 50s actually demonstrated that you by giving steroids, which were very you know they're kind of blunderbust type of therapies, you know there were lots of side effects associated with steroids. But one of the benefits was that you would reduce inflammation, and all, all the time, all along, ever since then, up until the last 20 to 25 years, probably, most of the treatments have been steroid based. So if you, you know, if you've got a relapse or if you had a flare up of your symptoms, you were usually put onto steroids. If you had to take steroids more than three or four times a year, then you would end up perhaps on, a, on another type of drug, which we call steroid sparing. So those drugs such as azathioprine or methotrexate, these typical drugs. And then about 15 years, 20 years ago, uh, there was a really major breakthrough in, in treatment of not only Crohn's disease in terms of the inflammation, but other inflammatory diseases, particularly rheumatoid arthritis, for example. And scientists discovered that there was a particular protein in the body called tissue necrosis factor, TNF. And that protein is pivotal, meaning really critical in causing inflammation. And if, if you could switch off that inflammatory response by giving a drug, then actually you make a big difference to people with Crohn's disease. So early on, those studies demonstrated massive improvements in people with Crohn's. People that had really terrible Crohn's, and, and this is important to, to mention as well, not everybody with Crohn's has terrible disease. Yeah, you know, some people have really mild symptoms, they barely know they have the problem. But other people, such as yourself, who've had surgery, Clearly, you've had major difficulties. Um, and, and so what we found was that when we started giving these proteins, these, these anti-inflammatory drugs, uh, these much more powerful anti-inflammatory drugs, that it would reduce that inflammation so dramatically that the number of people needing surgery for their Crohn's or needing to go on to these more other drugs, um, the steroids and others, actually diminished very, very quickly. Um, and then since then, there have been other developments where we realize that not only do, um, not only is it tissue necrosis factor or TNF, but there are other proteins in, in our bodies that we produce, all of which serve a very useful purpose, but sometimes 
for some reason they react against you they start to attack you and and that is when it becomes detrimental to your health but we now know that there's a whole line of different proteins uh, and the pharmaceutical industry is working extremely hard to identify these and develop drugs which then knock them out they cancel them and and all of these all these treatments will actually be very beneficial for Crohn's and I think mm. in the not too distant future if you look into the future where are we going well we're going into that area where we can really define treatment mm. and, Make it and very by specific based on a particular protein correct mm. based yeah. on a protein based on your genetic profile based on other factors that if we can then um, tabulate them we can then say right if you if you're a female and you have this type of Crohn's disease and you have this genetic makeup then actually you're going to do really well on this drug wow. but you're not going to do so well on that drug so let's not waste time or money let's just go straight to that drug so you know this whole th evolution of pharmacotherapy medicine. personalized medicine yeah. yeah which is the future and and so it should be mm. um, and those i think we call them biologics don't we the the, the drugs we've been talking yes, about they yeah. often end in the word mab so <laughs> unpronounce, unpronounceable the hard, the names the infliximab yeah. adalinumab well, there's infliximab there's adalinumab there's ustokinzumab there's sertazilumab I mean, there's a whole line so of for, these So for people drugs, who have yeah. this disease, if you're taking something ending in MAB, that's what we're talking about. What about your treatment, Carrie? Because it's interesting, yeah, it's actually, so, isn't well, it's, it? You know, I, I'm thinking steroids, tick, azathioprine, tick, anti-TNF, tick, <laughs> biologic, tick. <laughs> I've done all of those over the years. And um, I think biologics were the most successful for me with the Crohn's. But unfortunately, they were then damaging my liver. Wow. And I think that's the other thing is that you, you gain in one area but you don't gain in another for me I was under Professor Hunter at Cambridge for many years Adam Brooks and he was developing um, thinking around diet and that side of things so that doesn't work for everybody yeah. but for me that has probably been the best thing so if I go on to what's known as an elemental diet I just have a drink and I live on that drink I'm a very cheap date <laughs> I just cost a prescription um I can stay on that for two to three months and right. I did in fact the whole series two of fame academy I was right. on that drink um giving my bowel a total rest seems to work for me I don't know whether the science supports that but the evidence within my body is that that works for me well i mean i will refer to dev but i would suggest that the science for the science actually doesn't recommend that would be the best treatment for everybody no but it just goes Absolutely. to show doesn't it this personalized medicine the data can tell us that this is the best treatment for the majority but as an individual you may be the outlier and that's what's worked for you it's certainly i mean you touched on a really important point there carrie because diet and what we eat, what we put into our body is incredibly, is incredibly important, not only for people with Crohn's who have nutritional problems and they're deficient in these proteins or these minerals, but actually as a form of therapy. Mm. So one of the questions that we often get asked in clinic by patients is, what can I eat? You know, what should I eat? Mm. What shouldn't I eat? Um, and in general, people with Crohn's disease often will have other intolerances. So they may be lactose intolerant they may be fructose intolerant. So fructose is a, another type of sugar, it's a bit like glucose. But they may have these other intolerances. And so they may be thinking that they're being healthy by drinking milk and having cheese yes. and getting <laughs> calcium and to high things. levels of calcium, <laughs> all these things. But actually, they've got lactose intolerance consequent to their Crohn's disease. Yeah. And if they stay off of those things, if they stay off of very high fiber foods and they stick to, um, well, avoid things like, um, uh, lentils and beans and and those sorts of things which are very high in fiber and 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 non-absorbable fiber then actually they may they may be better off and often we find that people with Crohn's do struggle with saturated fats as well fried foods and meats sometimes caffeine can You've trigger not got much left well by the thing, time. Is, the <laughs> thing is you see what's what's really what's really the distinction that's really important to draw is that that these foods don't they don't cause your Crohn's to get worse no they're not they're not suddenly switching on the inflammatory process they're giving you symptoms yeah. so by by cutting down on those things you, you get less symptoms yeah. I think I think um 
this is why it's so important that dietitians form part of the team oh, yes. when it comes to managing yes, inflammatory yes. bowel disease because you know it's it like you say you can get to a point where you're excluding lots of things and doing that with professional support would be advisable oh, you have to yeah i've always had the dietitian yeah. there 100% well do you know what we've completely run out of time <laughs> and we could talk about this for so much longer but i just want to say a huge thank you, thank you carrie for sharing your your own experience and i think you know some really powerful lived experiences that you've shared that i think will really help others as well so thank, thank you, you so much thank and dev thank you for sharing thank you. your expertise as well and like that's just My really pleasure. fascinating information and i feel like i feel like i can fill out one of those uh, educational forms now i feel like i'm fully CPD. updated <laughs> a cpd i'm up to date on my knowledge of treatments for, for crohn's disease but yeah thank you both thank so you. very thank much you. thank you